Can you guys hear me? All right. So today I'm going to present some work on analyzing gene expression data and how to implement this implementation in R. So when I was preparing for the slides, I, I realized the background of this audience might be very diversified. So maybe you can help me understand a little bit. How many of you actually work in IT industry? Oh, that's probably the majority, more than 50%. How many of you work in pharmaceutical and the biotech industry? Just a few. So how many of you work in finance consulting industry? None, hoops, super. We are all technical guys. So when I prepared this slide, I decided because the background is so diversified, so I'm thinking about maybe I just present a little bit of everything. So I have some data here. So, but if you don't like data, I also present some algorithms. So if you don't like algorithms, I also have some codes. I hope at least you like one of the three options. But if you like need of this, I think it's time proper for you to reconsider your career. That's not a good career for you to work in. If you don't like data, if you don't like algorithm, if you don't like codes. Okay, so first, uh, this you know very typical thing for our highly regulated industry people to do. This is just my personal opinion, not my company's opinion. So all along, first I present some gene expression data, and then I will present the actual case study, how to analyze this data. So first we need to do some quality control to detect the outliers, and then I present some work using univariate analysis, then the multivariate analysis. Then I also briefly talk about how to implement this like a huge data analysis on the sun grid engine, and then conclude and some discussions. So first, uh, just a, you know, a quick brief introduction on what gene expression data is. So we know actually all the, you know, the life information is coded in the chromosome, the DNA. Then DNA is transcribed to what's called a messenger RNA. The expression of mRNA, that's the messenger RNA, is the gene expression biomarker actually we are going to work on today. And also, you know, the next step is the information from the gene expression translated to protein. Protein actually is the basic unit, you know, keep your functioning of the body and the brain work in every animal and every human. So we don't have laser point here. So, uh, okay, you can see this mouse. So that's the biomarker data we, we want to talk about today. But also, I just want to you know, briefly mention, actually in biotech and the pharmaceutical industries, we work with, with a lot of biomarker data, so including the DNA data, that's genetic study, and the microarray data we are talking about today, and also protein data, that's called proteomics, and also imaging data, for example, particularly for neuroscience studies. So this is a data structure, actually quite straightforward. You see this is just a big matrix so each row includes all the data from one particular gene. So we have many, many rows. Each row is for one gene. And also there are many, many columns. Each column is for one sample or one patient or one subject. So just this big matrix. So the goal of this study is we want to predict the, the outcome using gene expression. The outcome might be binary, disease or healthy or maybe continuous, for example, blood pressure, or maybe survival outcome to predict if a cancer patient can survive or not. So in this presentation, we develop a model pre to predict, particularly for binary outcome, whether a subject is diseased or healthy. And the, the gene expression data is from FE matrix, the you know, HGU, it's quite a long time, 133 plus two chips. So that's kind of like, a, kind of like standard chips to acquire the gene expression data for human. So we have two groups of subjects. One is healthy people, the other is diseased people. And so you see there are totally about 50,000 probes. That's roughly speaking 50,000 of variables, 50,000 of genes in, on this chip. And totally we have about 200 subjects. So first we just plot this data, and you see this is the each box. So you see there are many, many box plots. Each box, box represents all the genes within one subject. 
So if the first of few are pa uh, patient uh, gene expression and the rest are controlled, I mean the health, the gene expression for healthy people. So first you see that they are actually are highly skilled. If you, you know, understand that the way the box plotter is made, is, it, the, this, the black bar is the mean, and you see the mean is all towards the lower end, so very highly skilled data. And uh, actually, if we plot a density plot, this becomes more weird. You see almost all the values are concentrated around the zero. So definitely, this data is not the right data we should just begin to analyze on because of this highly skewed, very weird data. So the simple trick, oops, we do, you know, as a statistician, we have a lot of tools. One is the transformation. We just do the log two transformation, then you see this data looks more like, you know, symmetric and normal distribution data. And this is the, of the transformation, the density plot. So it looks more uh, uh, comprehensible, understood, uh, easily, but also you see actually there's a, one subject is kind of very different from the rest. So that's a suggestion, this one might be an outlier. So another thing for the gene expression data we do is we need to do the normalization. So if you go back to this one, the box plot, you see the gene expression for this subject such as more or less different, some are higher, some are lower, the normalization is nothing but bring down the OR gene expression to the same level to make them comparable. So why we do this? This is because they're actually the biological basis. The biological theory is for most of the genes, the expression should be more or less the same across all the subjects and on the disease conditions. No matter you're healthy, no matter you've got disease, like for example, you've got a cold today, or you get up in the morning, or you wake up in the evening. The gene expressions for most of the genes should be the same, more or less the same, because that's the majority chunk of genes to maintain the body run. So that's the biological theory. So based on this theory, we want to bring the gene expression levels comparable across all the subjects. So that's the normalization. But also normalization, you know, it's actually very, a lot of things we can talk about in normalization is a special topic, so I'm not going to cover all the details today. I just mentioned actually what we use is called quantile normalization. So basically, we make the quantiles for each subject comparable. Then by doing this, we normalize the data. So this is after normalization. You see the densities of all the subjects are aligned. So one thing we, we want to look at this data, you know, that there's people ask about like say big data, but but for me like saying, I think actually there are big issues for big data analysis. One is where you obtain this big data, right? If you don't have data, you can develop all these algorithms method, but doesn't it's not going to be useful. The second thing is very typical. You got big data, but what's about the quality of this big data? Garbage in, garbage out. So one thing definitely we need to do is first we have some quality control of this data to make sure this data makes sense. So for example, for this gene analysis, one thing we do is we do this uh, hierarchical clustering, also called a dendrogram. So we class all these subjects based on the correlations between the gene expression between subjects. So for example, you look at this clustering. You see this one? is obviously this one single subject, it's, it's in its own class by itself. So this suggests this subject might be highly likely to be an outlier. So this is one way we use to look at the data to see the correlations between these subjects. Another way, a different, from different angle of view, we just use the principal component analysis so we project the, the high dimension gene expression data. Recall the dimension of each data point is actually about 55,000. So that's a really high dimensional data. Then we project into two dimensional plot in using the principal component analysis. So you see this one. So the black point is from control group, that's healthy people. And the red points is from diseased people. So you see most of samples actually are in this big cloud. Also, you see, it seems there's a difference 
between the disease population and the health population. Because on the first principal component, it looks the center of the disease population is a little bit shifted to the right. But also you see this particular subject that's kind of far away from the big cloud. So which also suggests that this might be an outlier. So another thing we do for the gene exploration data is like a, we have this called a robust Mahananobis distance to try to identify if there are any potential outliers. So I list the algorithms. That's for people who like algorithms. So this is the part that you're probably going to enjoy. So first step is we use a robust principal component analysis. So we use the Hubert distance. Why we use a robust PCA? is because if we don't use a robust PCA, it's going to be very sensitive to outliers. Then it's going to skew the whole analysis using PCA analysis. So that's the trick we are using here in the first step. Then the second step, then we project to the top robust PCAs. So you're gonna have various different ways to choose how many principal components you want to keep in your analysis. For example, you can use some model selection criteria, or you can simply use, say, if the Total top PCA can explain, for example, you know, more than 80% of total variability, then we just include, keep those number of principal components. Then the next step, then we got these scores for these PCAs, then we calculate the Mahananobis distance using these PCA scores. So after this, we already projected the high dimensional data into relative lower dimension, then make this more handleable in, can, then we can use the classical multivariate analysis now. Then based on statistical theory, we, we know if there is no outlier, this suppose all these data points should follow a chi-square distribution, and the degrees of freedom is exactly the number of principal components. So then we make this plot. The x-axis is the theoretical you know, chi-square distribution with a degree of of freedom 10, that's the number of commo P, the principal components we keep in our model. And the y axis is the observed, oops, is the, is the quantile from the observed data. So you, if you see there's a big deviation, which suggests those data might be outliers. Actually, you see this one, the top one has really, really big deviation from the theoretical chi square distribution. Actually, this one is the same subject that we have seen in the previous QC analysis. Another thing we want to check is we want to see if gene expression also have a correlation with other variables. Could it be demographic variables, could it be experimental variables. Because we know when we run this 200 patients, there's no way we can run this in just one study or one batch. We have to do this in several different independent studies. But who knows, maybe there's some study to study difference. You run the same samples on day one, whether you got a different expression from the numbers you got you run on another day. And also maybe the gene expression might also depend on the gender, depend on the age. So if that's the case, we should include those variables in our analysis. So the way we are looking at it, how we see the association between this external demographic or experimental variables with this big high dimensional gene expression data. So actually similar idea we are using, we are using principal component again, but using this way to look at the total variance of the gene expression, how this associated with this external variables. So we apply the method called the principal variance component analysis uh, designed for the gene expression data. So the first step is still use the PCA. We project the gene expression onto a few principal components. Then for each principal component, we can get scores. So then for each subject, we get one score by projecting into this PC. Then we use the random effect model. So the response is the scores from the principal components. And we see if it has correlations to other variables, such as age, gender, and the batch, batch effect. And the, each variable is modeled as a random effect. That's the way we can get the, you know, obtain the variance estimation. For example, we can see, oh, 50, like say 2% of the total variability of gene expression actually can be expla explained by the age factor. So by doing this, we can get a variance component. 
then we sum up the total effects from all the top principal components then present in this plot. So you, you see this is the y-axis is percentage. So the total percentage is 100 percentage, that's 1.0. And this is a percentage explained by a number of external variables. And this is the huge bar is the variability, just the unexplained by the external variables. So if this bar is huge, which means we have less you know, correlations to other external variables. But for example, you see one bar, like say batch effect is huge, then you might want to consider to model the batch effect in your model to adjust the batch to batch difference. But for this particular data, it looks fairly good. We probably don't need to worry about age effect, gender effect, or batch effect. So first we just use the univariate analysis. This is just, a, it's nothing but just checking the correlation between the outcome and each individual gene one by one. So the algorithm we use is uh, actually several steps. I'm going to explain the steps. But first let's go over the algorithm. First we just make the RC for each gene. RC is a, is a device to measure the association between each gene and the binary outcome. And uh, you know, I, I didn't go over the details of how to make RC, but if you are interested, certainly we can talk about this. Then second step, we rank the genes by using the area under RC. So the, the, there's a theory, at least in step three. Basically, it amounts to a hypothesis testing if the area under RC equals to 0.05. Because if it equals to 0.05, which means it's equivalent to just randomly flipping the coin. You, you don't have any prior information, you just flip the coin, then you got RC equals to 0.05. And if you got a bigger RLC, AURC, which means you have a stronger association between the gene and the binary outcome. And also, we have this nice theory. We know that testing this particular hypothesis is actually equivalent to the well-known non-parametric test, the Wilcox rank test of difference between the two groups. So we can easily obtain the statistics p-values from this test. The next step, we calculate the false discovery rate because we have so many genes there's no way we can have this you know, traditional control of the family-wise error. I, I don't know how many of you actually know what's the family-wise error, but you probably just take what I talk about this for now. And then we calculate the, the adjusted confidence interval for the AULC. Then we select genes if the lower bound of the confidence interval is above some given threshold. So th this is just one example. Actually, that's the top gene we picked up from this analysis. We s you see the AUC area on the curve is 0.781. Then compared to 0.5, that's just the random, random, randomly guessing. So this looks uh, fairly good. And uh, just a short you know, brief introduction of what's false discovery rate. So you see. So for this genes, we can uh, assume the genes, there are two sets of genes. One set of genes is all the way in this H0, which means there is no group difference in this gene expressions between the health people and the patient people. The other set of genes, the rest of genes, actually there is a group difference. So one is called H0, one is called H1. This, this is the truth, but certainly we don't know the truth we, we need to figure out what, you know, need to do estimations, do predictions. Then this is from our analysis. Then we declare that there's a V. Number of genes are significant. Oh, no, actually we declare there are R. Number of genes are significant. Oops. And the totally there are M number of genes and we do declare M minus R, number of genes are insignificant, which means there's no difference between the groups. Of course, we know that then we have four situations. One situation is, you know, in truth, actually there's a difference, then we declare the significant. But then we made some mistakes, we declare the significant. Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> the other way. So this is actually, in theory, I mean, the truth is there's no, significant, there's no difference, but we think that there's a difference. And this one is actually there's a difference, and we declare significant. And this is actually there's no difference, and we declare non-significant. 
So that's good. Well, also we can make another type of mistake. Actually, when there's a difference, although we declare there's non-significant. So we want to, the number of genes in these two cells as large as possible, and then minimize the number of genes in these two cells as small as possible. So the first discovery rate actually is just control this V divided by R. That's nothing but the expected proportion of first discoveries. So for example, you want to control first discovery rate at 0.01, which means you know, in the 1,000 1, selected genes, at most about 10% of them are first discoveries. So there's a procedure called the Benjamini Hodgeberg procedure to calculate the first discovery rate. Then we can, based on this, to also adjust the confidence intervals. So how about time? Oh, time runs really fast. So probably I'll just skip this. I'm talking about the multivariate analysis. So now we are considered the combination of multiple genes to predict the outcomes. So first of all, we should realize not all genes are informative or predictive. Actually, most of the genes are supposed not, based on good biological reasons. So this means we need to do some variable selection. And the second, after we selected these variables, we also need to consider how to combine those genes. Shall we use a linear combination, or some, shall we also introduce some interactions between those genes, or maybe do even more complicated non-parametric modeling using trees? So the first model we, we use, the, we, it's called a stabilizer lasso. So I, I, I think probably many of you have heard of a lasso already. And the lasso is nothing but just a you know, L1 penalty. The, the, by using L1 penalty, actually people can get a, a more sparse model, which means many variables actually are excluded from this model. So by doing this, naturally we got model selection. And uh, the one thing is you need to decide how big a penalty you want to impose, which equal to how many variables you want to select to your model. So here we use a tenfold cross-validation to, to, for the variable selection. But we also realize that if we just run this tenfold cross-validation one time, then you run this second time, you got different set of selected variables. So we so that's one thing we are going to do in the stabilizer lasso. We just run this tenfold cross validation many, many times. For example, 100 times. Then we keep a variable if it's only picked more than 90% of the 100 times, just for example. So by doing this, we stabilize the variable selection procedure. So you know, for people who like the codes, so this is the codes we use. There's a very nice package called GMNet in R, which can do the lasso. And so this X matter is just all the gene expression. Y matter is the response binary outcome. Family binomial, which means because this outcome is a binary, so that's corresponding to the probability distribution. It's called a binomial distribution. And the type of measures, we use deviance. But also there's another option. You can use the AUC. That's just the AUC uh, of uh, ROC curve. And then we can run this cross validation and we return this result. So just a very simple parallel implementation. So this is a, a you know one thing fairly easy to do, very very easy to do. If you want to use all the CPU cores on your laptop or in one node, so we can use this do parallel package. It can you know detect how many cores existing on this laptop or on the node. Then you can use this by using this for each. Then you can parallel all this computation. Very easy to do. And uh, another method we call it, we tried is called gradient boosting trees. So this is a really interesting idea. So the basic philosophy is just a, iteratively we add a weak learner. So in this case, it's a tree to the current model. Then we keep improving the model. The new tree is a fit to the residuals. So the residuals, you know, is the part cannot be explained by the current model. And particularly for Gaussian normal distribution data, we know the residuals is nothing but the differences between observations and the fitted values. But more generally for like other type of data, for example, for survival data, for binary outcomes, the residuals actually is the functional derivatives of the negative log likelihood. 
So that's why it's called a gradient, because that's actually the residual part. So the algorithms, so that, that, I, I, actually what I'm trying to do here is I just put the algorithms in words rather than in equations. So first step is very simple. We just find a constant which can fit the data best. So we initialize the model with a constant by minimize the negative log likelihood. Then second step, given the current best feed FM, we calculate the residuals. So that's the distance or, devi or devi deviation between the observations and the model feed. Then next step we use the residuals as a response. Then we're using a regression tree to feed those residuals. Then next step for each terminal node in the regression tree, you, you see the tree, right? Like a binary tree, then there are many, many terminal nodes. For each terminal node, we find the constant to be added to the current feed to best improve the feed for the data in the terminal node, only for the data in the terminal node. Then we do this for all the terminal nodes. Then for each terminal node, we got an estimated constant. Then we add this constant to the current model for the data in each terminal node. Then that's the new model. Then we repeat this you know, many, many times until it stop. So there are some parameters when you try to use this model. You need to decide the total number of trees. That's also equivalent to the total number of steps in the gradient boosting method. And uh, you know, it's very important because you know, just like all the machine learning method, if you make this model too complicated, then you got this all fitting issue. So you need to pick up what's the right number of number of trees. That's the right model complexity in this model. Now, another parameter you want to specify is how complicated each tree is. So this is the tree depth uh, parameter. If you got just depth one, which means just additive effects. If depth equals two, then it's a two-way interaction. Suddenly you can make each tree more complicated. Another, any question? Yeah. Uh, another parameter actually is very useful. It's called a shrinkage. So this is a really useful trick, I can tell you in practice. If you want to get a better feed, you want to make this shrinkage. You want to actually introduce shrinkage in your model fitting. The cost is you are going to pay longer time to run for this model, but you are going to get a better fit. And also another uh, parameter is called a back fraction. So this try to introduce some uh, run randomness in your model fitting. So for when you fit the next tree, we are not going to use all the data, but we just randomly select a certain percentage of data for the model fitting for the next tree. Okay, yeah, I, I'm going to speed, so yeah. So you, you can see, you know, you have the code here. That's actually, you know, just to, uh, include all these parameters I've talked about. And the time is running out, so I, I'm just to show you this is the way we summarize how important each variable is. We use this called percentage relative influence. And also we can check the partial dependence between the outcome and each selected variables. So this is just a very simple you know, mention of the, the SunGrid engine we're using. So this is the cluster you know, our company has. So from each laptop, you can submit, you can log in to the master host, then you can submit your job into this execution host. So there are two levels of parallel computing we can do. Is first, that we submit the jobs to the nodes, then second, on each node, we can use the multiple CPU calls on the node. So this is just some script, you know, if you want to use the SGE. And this is some code if you want to use multiple CPUs on a node. So, yeah, just a conclusion. So we illustrated a case study of gene experiencing data to predict the outcomes. Then we, you know, covered this analysis pipeline, including transformation, normalization, quality control, univariate analysis, and multivariate analysis. Then also we briefly talk about the parallel computation implementation. So I just want to use maybe one or two minutes to talk about actually some ongoing research we're working on on personalized medicine. I think this is a very exciting and uh, you know, really interesting research area. So basic idea is we know 
the drug is not going to work for all the patients. It's going to benefit a proportion of the patients. And also for a given patient, the, the treatment, you know, treatment A might works well, better than treatment B. But for another patient, the, the decision might be reversed. So the goal is try to identify the optimal treatment for each individual patient. So we actually developed an approach adapted to random forest idea, but we modified the tree to include the treatment information, so what we call interaction tree, to predict what's the optimal treatment for a given patient. And also it's implemented with the SunGrid engine, and each job actually is submitted to grow an independent tree. Then we can bag in all this tree together to make a random forest. Okay, yeah, any question? Or shall we leave a question to the end? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a really good question. Actually, we, we don't use any GPUs, but it, you raise a good question. That might be something we should explore, particularly for the parallel computation. Yeah, particularly, I'm thinking about, I know some guys actually use a GPU to analyze imaging data, because it makes a lot of sense. For each voxel or pixel, you know, you've got a time series for the function IMI, then you can use each GPU to analyze this time series and combine all them together. But we didn't use this so far. Yeah. So he'll be around uh, for yeah. more questions later, so let's get him back.